Anyway, um, so uh, last uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Andy's Breakfast, um, Andy's Breakfast Club, and uh, Pastor Zach has really uh, been working hard with this, and I know Jonathan has joined in, and uh, I think we have at least two more people that have joined in and committed to this. What happens? This is Monday through Friday. Get some more information as you walk around. Talk to Pastor Zach. Talk to Rachel. Um, so uh, it's it's really an awesome thing, and we also have uh, uh, other spots that are uh, we we could fill in and and need it there. So this is a community program that feeds children, right? Children uh, Monday through Friday, and uh, it starts around I think eight o'clock. Uh, eight food pickups at 845, and it's uh, right in town, uh, right around the, the churches there by uh, Phoenix Park. But anyway, get in touch with Pastor, or Rachel can get you some more information on that. And uh, the other thing is on each of your seats, we have a connection card. The connection card is a way for the river to get in touch with you guys. If you're here for the first time and you saw this on your seat, that's what it's all about. Um, so on the... Uh, Part of the card there, it's got your name, address, and some information. Um, we just want to be able to connect with you throughout the week uh, one way. Then there's also a checkbox here if you want a little bit more information about uh, several of the different ministries here at the river. And then on the most important part on the back is the prayer section. If you feel comfortable writing, some writing down a prayer or a praise or or just something that's uh, that's on your heart, feel free to do that. When the offering comes around in a little while, put that in the offering bucket and let our prayer team uh, pray over that. They meet every Tuesday and uh, get together for prayer. And then you can kind of check how you'd want that prayer shared. Um, nothing's going to go out on the interweb, but we'll share it with our prayer team. And we'd like to, as a community, pray for you if you have something special like pray for. So, that is the connection card. All right. You ready, Z? Yeah. Do it. <laughs> you guys, you guys are having fun. Too much fun today. Good morning, church. Good morning. Um happy Sunday. Uh it is uh, a great day. Uh, I just want to start out by saying thank you to everyone who serves. Uh a lot of you get here around um 10 till and um and it's a Kind of a crazy madhouse in here from about 7.30 until about 9.50 uh, where things are happening and walls are being put up. And I just want to thank everyone who serves, um, whether you serve uh, at the kids' check-in table, uh, Linda has been there and has done just a masterful job at, at making sure that happens. Where is she at? Is she back there, like still checking kids in? Um, and Bob was here with Jen greeting for the first time. That was awesome today. Thank you so much. Uh, Larry had coffee going. Um, Jesse is doing projection for the first time ever. Um, it's, I just want to say thank you for the, the worship team, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for all that you guys do, uh, cause you make me look, you make me look good and I appreciate that. Um, my name is Zach. I am the lead pastor here at the River Church. This is week number nine in this space. We haven't done worship with the door open yet. How's everyone feeling about that? I feel like it's a good feel, um, yeah, it's it's crazy. I feel like we got to move the yeah, that's true. Before the mosquitoes, I feel like we got to move the wall so you can all like see the lake. I, like I just am looking at a black wall right now, or this wall. We just lift this wall, lift them all up next time. Got it? That's the that's the plan. Um, today we're going to continue in our series called Rhythms of Grace, uh, practicing missional habits together. We're using a book called Surprise the World: Five Habits of Missionally Highly Missionally People. Um, we're following along this book, and there's an acronym. It's BELLS, B-E-L-L-S. Uh, we're following along with that. So those are BLESS, EAT, LEARN, LISTEN, and SENT. Last week, we hit that first one up, uh, the word BLESS, or the concept of blessing, using the Hebrew word BARACH, which means to kneel to. And we talked about how God, through His Son, Jesus, knelt down to us to encourage us to lift us up to save us from ourselves by giving of himself for our sake. And just as Abraham was called to bless others with what God had done for Abraham, we too are called to be a blessing to others as well because of what God has done for us. We are called to bless others. 
We are called to kneel to others. So last week, we put out this challenge. We asked all of you to say, are there three people in your life where you could bless this week? Three people, whether they be in church or in your family or at work or at home, wherever, bless three people. And I've heard a couple different stories of, of that challenge uh, that's been really fun to hear how maybe you have been blessed or maybe you have blessed others. And this week we're going to put out another challenge, but I really want to lift up the idea, the simple idea that this, that last week challenge and this week challenge, it, it doesn't end. What happens if you like build on it? What happens if you bless three more people this week? What happens when you build blessing other people into the rhythm of your life, constantly looking for ways to bless people because of how God first blessed us? And today, we're going to add that second letter of the acronym, my favorite habit. We're talking about the everyday rhythm of eating. There are some things that I will give a message about that might pose a challenge to you, but today is not one of those. Because let's face it, all of you eat. Some of us eat all the time, either three or six meals a day. So the, the rhythm of eating is not a difficult thing, but how, the, however, the, what, we're, what we'll find is the hard part of this rhythm and the challenge that comes along with it is the intentionality behind who you eat with, where you go to eat, how you do it. I know a number of you have participated in mission trips in the past um, and, and have enjoyed the experience. My experience, I've, I've had to lead quite a few mission trips. Uh, and leading a trip with 30 or 40 or 50 kids gets a little crazy, um, especially when you're in a foreign place doing different things, organizing work schedules or preparing for worship every single night or travel plans to and from a particular destination and then to and from where you're going to work or where you're going to play on that trip. There's a lot that goes into planning trips with any amount of people. And you can knock all of those things out of the park. You can have the greatest, like, the plans, the work is awesome. You go to the coolest places, you see the coolest things. All of that you can knock out of the park. But if you mess up food, the whole thing crumbles. If you mess up the meals, you got cranky people on your hands. And the whole thing falls apart. So let me tell you, I am well versed in knowing how many pizzas to buy based on the number of people in the group. I know how many spaghetti cans to buy based on how many, how many grains of strands of Noodles? Like, what is a single noodle called? Just maybe just noodle. But I know how many spaghetti cans to buy. Spaghetti cans, spaghetti sauce cans to buy. I know how many loaves of bread I need for a week for sandwiches for kids. The most important part of planning any trip, specifically a mission trip, is the food. It's because it's what gives us energy. It gives us nourishment to do the things that we're doing. But I'd also tell you, that food is the most important part of any trip because of what happens when you're eating. Because food is the greatest relationship elixir. Because everybody needs to eat. But when someone who you don't know very well is sitting across a table and you're eating together, it's really difficult not to engage with them, right? There, there's got to be some sort of, you're not going like, to just stare at your soup and eat it. That's not how it works. Food brings people to the table in a way that there, you don't have many places. Some of the most impactful experiences that I've ever had, some of the most memorable moments in my life on trips happened around a table. I have pictures for you. I've sat around fires with kids eating hot dogs. That was our table. You know, our lap is our table. I've gone to foreign countries I've eaten with people who, you know, like they make these, these meals for you and, or they buy food for you and you know that they can't afford it and you experience hospitality. I've, I've been to foreign places. I've made a mess of myself with powdered sugar eating beignets in New Orleans with some of my favorite people. I've gone to some crazy Tex-Mex bar in St. Paul, Minnesota and hung out with some of the most amazing people I've ever met, 
through my seminary experience. Around the tables in our lives, relationships are formed. They're shaped and they're nurtured far beyond just a simple meal. At the table, I've experienced hospitality in ways I've not experienced anywhere else. I've experienced community like I haven't anywhere else. And I'd guess so have so many of you. At tables exactly like this one. And we covered it up, but you wouldn't be able to tell if, if you have been to a, our 8th Street office. If you've been to the Java joint on 8th Street back in the day. This very table was one of those tables you probably sat around. This very table is one of those tables that you built relationships. You've, had, you've, you've laughed and you've cried at, at probably this very table. Since we've moved here, one of our focuses has been on the table, gathering around the table. And I've been asked, why do we do this every single week, Zach? Are you trying to make us Lutheran, Zach? Is that what you're trying to do? Like you came from a Lutheran church, is that what you're trying to do? And I go, is communion every week Lutheran? And I've had to challenge myself on that. I'm like, I don't think so, but let me think about it. But the table, let's face it, this table is where people come together. People of all walks of life, people who are broken and, and, and hungry, maybe hungry for something other than food, or maybe they're hungry for food. Simple answer to why we gather around the table. Because it's at the table that we experience the most important parts of our life. When you look at Jesus' life, he was always gathering around the table, sharing the most important aspects of who he was with them. When Jesus gathered around tables with his disciples, on the night in which he was betrayed, he doesn't tell them, oh, guess what? You guys are going to go out and you're going to be a church. And you're going to do this, this, and this. He doesn't give them a list of things to do. He doesn't give them a comprehensive system of doctrines to believe. He didn't prescribe a, a doctrinal statement for everyone to sign. He didn't say you have to believe at the table. He said, no, you have to belong at a table first before you believe. He offered them a meal at the table. He told them, Every time you gather, do it around a table and remember me. So why do we gather around the table every single week? It's not because I'm trying to make you a Lutheran, please. Trust me when I say that. It's because Jesus told us every time we gather, we do it around a table. We eat. That's pretty awesome. So we're going to keep gathering around the table because this is where Jesus invites us to share in the most important things in our lives. These are Paul's words from the first letter to the church, for, from his first letter to the church in Corinth, reminding them of what Jesus told his friends. He said, "The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread." It wasn't kind of like this bread. Although I'm glad we have this bread and not Jesus' bread. He gave thanks, gave it to his friends, saying, This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his friends, saying, This cup is the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Whenever you come to the table, remember me. Why wouldn't we want to come to the table all the time? For as long as you eat the bread, he says, and drink the cup, you proclaim my coming. Friends, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to partake in the, in the meal in the middle of the message because I'm like, we're here. Paul told us we're here. Why not take communion while we're here? And I want you to, to come to the table today and be like, why am I doing this? Am I doing this? J Jesse's in charge of the slides. Um, <laughs> I told her, I briefly said, like, uh, she, I said, you can put whatever you want up on the screen. And she's like, how about this? I go, you can put whatever you want up on the screen. Um, it's creative liberties, guys. If you want to do the slides and make them reverent like this, you have the opportunity to. Just ask Charlotte. Uh, but I want you to, to, to come to the table today 
and realize like Jesus calls us to the table. Every time we gather like this, Jesus calls us to the table. Every single time. So we're going to have our communion assistants come on up. And we're going to take communion. We'll set it back a little bit. If you guys want to come back here. Church, the table is ready. The invite is here. You don't need to be a member of our church. You just need to literally walk through the great door. Because that's what Jesus says every single time you gather. Do so in remembrance of me. Do with your friends. So come, all is ready. I like throwing curveballs every once in a while. In our prayer meeting, we do a prayer meeting at 9.15 on Sundays um, to just kind of touch base with everyone. And Jesse was the only one who knew that we were going to do communion differently. Um, And everyone's like, we're going to do it in the middle of the message? And I said, yes. And then Sarah just said to me, "Um, are you done? (laughs) I'm like, because Sarah's always like, come on, Zach, you're talking too much. Um, Well, my dear, I'm not done. I still have another six pages left. Sorry. All right. (laughs) This is a... In the book, Surprise the World, there are a couple of quotes I want to share with you regarding the importance of the table and the habits we form around the table and the tables in our homes and other places. Simon Carey Holt says this, it's through the daily practice of the table that we live a life worth living. Through the table, we know who we are, where we come from, what we value, and what we believe. At the table, we learn what it means to be family and how to live in responsible and loving relationships. Through the table, we live out our neighborliness and claim a sense of home and belonging. At the table, we celebrate beauty, express solidarity with those who are broken and hungry. Alan Hirsch, another missiologist that uh, is quoted in the book, says this, sharing a meal is one of the most sacred places we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is, tremendous, is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. Get this. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. You might screw up prayer. You might screw up Bible study. But eating, you can do. And that can get you in. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Eating can and bring you in, can usher you into the kingdom of God. If every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or poor person into their house once a week, we'd literally change the world by eating. How profound is this for us to hear? Think about the way Jesus did things. It was at meals. It was at the table. Jesus brought the kingdom of God alive before people's very eyes. It was at the table Jesus instituted an economy of grace by the way of thanksgiving and hospitality and mutuality and unity. The table economy was the extension of what God was doing throughout all of the Old Testament, the mission of reconciliation. And it was brought into people's homes. It wasn't just a temple thing anymore. When Jesus sat around the table with people, it became something that could be accessible anywhere. The table is a symbol of God's hospitality, a God who invites us to the table to feast on God's goodness and share in the abundance of God's kingdom. The table is a symbol of community where people come together to do life with one another, caring for one another, hearing one another, loving one another in Christ. The table is an expression of God's mission in the world empowered by the Holy Spirit through us. As God has extended his hospitality to us at the table, we are then called to have a a table that is open to anyone who would accept the invitation. Remember, God first knelt down to us. God first extended grace to us. And as individuals, as the church, as those who follow Jesus, it is up for us to kneel to and extend a great grace to others. And for the early church, that was done at tables. It wasn't done in a space like this. 
It wasn't done under steeples. It wasn't done in auditoriums. It was done around the table. If you think about the creation of the church some 2,000 years ago, they didn't do it like this. They gathered around a table. This is where the church started. This is where it was multiplied. This is where it grew and strengthened. After the cross, it's the table that takes the secondary position of the symbol of our faith. It was a symbol of hospitality for people. It was a symbol of community for people. It was the embodiment of who Jesus is and how Jesus transformed people. I know I like to talk a lot about Jesus' mission in, in my, my messages. But I think we so easily get off track when we focus what we're supposed to do and we lose sight of what Jesus actually did. Just think about Jesus' mission for a moment. The gospel is littered with, with a, a mission to bring good news to the poor, to release the captives, and break the chains of oppression. But throughout these four gospels, there are, there are words that appear that make it so blatantly obvious what our mission is based on what Jesus did. These words are, the Son of Man came to. The Son of Man came to do stuff. When it says this, I like perk my ears up and I pay more attention because I don't really have to read between the lines. There's no story that Jesus tells that I have to be like, well, I think the parable means this. When I see the Son of Man came to, I'm like, thank you, Lord, for making this really easy for me today because I understand the Son of Man came to do what? So I'm going to highlight three of these verses where it says the Son of Man came to that directs our understanding of Jesus' mission. The first of these is in Luke's gospel. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. Second is from Mark's gospel, chapter 10. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, these are foundational pieces of our faith. These are foundational pieces of, of who Jesus is and what Jesus' mission was. When we were asked about the church, what's the church's mission? What are we supposed to be doing? Man, alive, it's nice to have something like this right in front of us to say, well, Jesus did this, so maybe that should be our mission too. Jesus came to save those who were outsiders. Jesus came to, to bless those who were, were on the, the, the fringes. Jesus came to serve those who were, were not people who you would think could be served, could be loved. Jesus came to, to love people in ways that we could not understand. And that was his mission. But the second question we have to ask is, how did he do this mission? What were his methods? Chapter 7 in Luke's Gospel says this, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. He came eating and drinking. This was his method. This was the method of Jesus' madness, right? He came and he sat down around tables with people. This is how he brought about the kingdom of God. He just showed up in their homes and ate with them and drank with them. Church, we can talk about Jesus' theoretical mission all day long, that, that Jesus has, has come to, to release the captives and, and proclaim the good news of the poor and, and to save those who are far off and, and to serve those who are not people who you'd think could be served. We can talk about that in these messages all day long, but the methods are important. And one of the major methods for Jesus' mission was sitting around tables and eating with people. I love how Frost addresses this in his book. He says, it's always interested me that the one thing Jesus actually told us to do every time we meet together was eat. That's good news for those of us who like to eat. Church, if Jesus did this, why are we questioning the methods of Jesus? How do we do this church thing? The Son of Man came eating and drinking. I hate when it's like blatantly obvious like that. Like I can't, I can't miss it. It's like this conviction blows up in my face and I go, uh, yeah, what does that mean for me? Because it's so simple and blatantly obvious. But it's something that we just blow by. We're just like, we try to get our own way. We're, we're like, all we got to do is, is do this and this and this and this and then the mission of Jesus will be complete. 
Or then we'll understand more about the mission of Jesus. And sometimes he just says, eat and drink with people. That's it. And that's how you do it. Now, in the beginning of the series, I told you that I wasn't going to make you do things outside of your already busy schedules. And you might see the, the challenge of last week and go like, Zach, well, you asked me to bless three people, and that took me more energy and effort to do because I'm not normally used to thinking about life in that way. I don't normally bring gifts to people. I don't normally say nice things to people. So I had to work hard at that. And if you're going to track down this path and you're going to make us do these things, and you're telling me about eating and how Jesus showed up to eat and drink with people, you better not tell me to eat and drink with people this week because that does not fit in my busy schedule. Well, guess what, church? That is exactly what I'm going to tell you to do. But I'm not going to do it in a way that you think. I know that y'all have busy schedules. I know that you all are running around crazy, especially in this time where it feels like you're just trying to find time to, to just do something nice outside. You're like, I just, I don't have much more room in my schedule to do these crazy challenges that are coming out of this book. But here's the thing. You are surrounded by people all over the place. You can't miss being around people. They might be sitting you with you right now, or maybe they interact with you on a daily basis, or it's someone that you, you see at work all the time, or maybe it's a person that you see at the same restaurant that you go to every single Tuesday. I'm not telling you that you have to go to some crazy place to sit with crazy people and have meals with them. I'm just saying go to the places that you're going to go and be more intentional about how is God calling me to, to do this differently today. I'm not saying that you need to walk up and down the street, streets in your neighborhood to invite people over to your house for a cookout. I'm not saying that. You could, if you're going to do that tomorrow, uh, you could, in fact, do that. I'm not telling you you have to do it, but I'm saying you could. That could be an easy way. You eat every day. You eat multiple times a day. And the question that, that Frost prompts us with in his book is, what happens when, when you leverage the everyday rhythms in your life to make a kingdom impact? What happens when you go to lunch at work and you, you see coworkers and you go, oh, maybe I'll just sit down there today? What happens when you go to a coffee shop and the person you're sitting next to is just off in their whatever world? I do it all the time. I put my headphones on right away. What happens if I just take five minutes to have a conversation with a person while I'm drinking my frappo, mocha, whatever. What happens when you open yourself to the idea that everywhere you go, you're being put there for a reason? From the coffee shops to your favorite pizza place in town. Everywhere you go, every meal you eat, God has multiple opportunities for you to love and lift up and care for others in a way that you cannot even begin to understand. So for this week, what would it look like to practice this habit by simply saying, Lord, I'm already going to eat. Who do you want me to eat with? You can invite other people to your house. You can go to restaurants or you can be like Jesus and just invite yourself over to other people's houses. That's what he did. Luke 19. Chris talked about it. Zacchaeus, right? He's like Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus, short guy up in the tree. I'm coming to your house today. Now, I wouldn't say that do that to random people, but Jesus did it. Like, I, I half jokingly say this. Like, there are people in this room that you can just say, hey, I want to come over to your house this week. I want to enjoy the backyard. It's not, I, it sounds crazy because we're like, we live in white picket fence world and we're like, you have to stay on your side of the fence and I'm going to stay on my side of the fence and, and I'll say hi to you. What happens when you open the gate up and let people in? I understand it's, it's moving us out of these, these, these norms that we've created for ourselves. But if we want the church to spill out beyond these walls, we're going to have to start creating this, or start taking up these habits of creating spaces for people to belong in our lives. Because let's face it, before anyone's ever going to believe what we believe, they have to feel like they belong to what we belong to. I'll tell you that the table is a much easier place for people to belong 
than it is on a Sunday morning. That's why Jesus' method was to create space for people to be heard, not to be told how to live, what to do. Jesus sat down at tables with people and listened and shared to create a sense of belonging long before they ever trusted in or believed in or were willing to take up their own cross for his sake. Now, I don't know about you, but in my church experience, I can, I can count more times that I've had more memorable experiences around a table than I ever have around a worship setting like this. And I don't want to devalue this because here I am standing in front of you, but let me be clear. What I say here is going to be forgotten two weeks from now. But you sitting around a table and building relationships and experiencing life with one another, that's going to go far beyond two weeks from now. As I'm saying this, <laughs> I'm realizing we're like, oh, this is awesome. Now go out there and do that and just remember the challenge. But people need a place to belong before they need something to believe in. That's just the reality of our world. And before they ever walk through these doors, the big door, the small door, the bus door, whatever door we got, before they ever would ever think about doing that, it's at the table that they have to sense, uh, get a sense of belonging. Frost says, you can't lose sight of the good goal of conversion, but follow Jesus' model of communion first and see what flowers from it. Transformation doesn't happen because of what I'm going to say on Sunday mornings. That's a, that's a humble pill to swallow for me. Because I know that usually when I show up on Sunday morning, even though I prepare all week, I know that it's not going to be like this life-changing experience for some people. But what happens at the table can be. And that's what I'm so excited about. What happens if you leverage any one of your meals this week? to eat with someone else? What happens when you leverage any one of the meals that you have this week to bless someone else? Stats tell me that you're going to eat up to 21 meals this week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For those of us who skip breakfast, you have 14 meals. That's a good chunk of, of meals for you to invite people into. And I'm not telling you you have to do all these crazy things. You got to go out and have a, a new person meet with you every meal. The challenge this week Eat with three people, one of which not sitting around this room. What happens when you go into a situation and you go, Lord, who can I eat with? You have 14 meals, 14 to 21 meals. One of those meals you can leverage to eat with somebody else. And if you, you can do all three people in the same time. Make it easy on you. You don't have to do three sets of coffee meetings. You can. But you can eliminate all of this challenge in one, in one fell swoop. This week, what happens when you start asking God, which tables do I need to show up? And who do you want me to eat with? Because it's at the table we create a sense of belonging before we ever get to a point of believing. It's at the table where the most important things in our life happen. <laughs> So why wouldn't we want to leverage the table with gospel intentionality? Let's pray. Lord God, you are good.